Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'een. In the name of God, the All Merciful, the Most Compassionate. All praise is due to God, the Lord of the Worlds. And prayers and peace upon His Messenger, His family, and His companions. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah in his introduction to his book The Beginning of Guidance talks about the importance of thinking about whether in our pursuit of knowledge whether we are people of riwaya or people of diraya. People of riwaya are people who transmit information from one person to the next. People of diraya or understanding are those who take that information not only transmit it but transmit it through action, understanding how to apply that information and use it. And this is what we're about here at Zaytuna College. We're about accessing the Islamic tradition and then using it in our context in the best way that we can here as we're living today. Sometimes we read about in our Islamic tradition about different systems which aren't really in place anymore today. One of these systems was the system of waqfs, of endowments. Sometimes we read about these things but don't really understand what it could mean for us today and how we apply it today. Insha'Allah, Dr. Hatem Bazian, Professor of Economics and Islamic Jurisprudence here at Zaytuna, will be speaking on this point today. Now before we start, I'd like to say one thing. This conversation is part of a series of conversations and a series of initiatives that are happening here at Zaytuna College. It's an exciting time to be involved in, in Zaytuna right now, especially in this period, this formative period, as we grow as an institution. If you are not involved in Zaytuna, either through supporting us in your prayers and supplications, supporting us financially, or spreading the word and applying to Zaytuna, you're really missing out on these exciting opportunities happening here, of which the lecture today is just one example. If you are, Jazakumallahu Khairan, may, may God bless you all for your work, and may we continue to provide opportunities like this to think about how to bring our tradition into our context in the most complete way and the way that will benefit the most people today. Without further ado, Dr. Hatem Bazian. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala khair al-mursaleen wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu li qawli. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And assalamu alaykum for all those who are joining us online. Uh, may Allah bless you for all your continued support, dua and help for Zaytuna to be the institution that uh, you hope and aspire for. Today I wanted to begin to tackle the subject of uh, waqf in Islam, and in particular as a model of sustainable development. Uh, and this is, the concept of sustainable development is a buzzword uh, these days, uh, and I'm not trying to lash on the buzzword just for its sake, but rather to say that early on in Islamic uh, history, the concept of sustainable development has been part and parcel of how Muslims thought about building institutions. And as such, we could say that if modern discourse have caught up to the use of terminology, and therefore we are once again, using that terminology is not to uh, diminish the long history and presence of that concept in, in Islam and in Islamic institutional building. To begin with, we have to define what is waqf uh, for 
uh, in Islam, uh, linguistically. Uh, waqf in uh, its basic definition is al-waqf is to designate a particular uh, property or a particular uh, uh, land, also a particular amount of wealth, and uh, to donate the proceeds or the accrued benefit that are driven from that, uh, to donate it for uh, the general public. Uh, even though that we have an area where uh, a family-oriented waqf has been established, where the accrued benefits is directed to uh, the family. Uh, we also have a different term that is also used in Islamic terminology, which is al-habs. And we find that the term al-waqf has been more used in the eastern part of uh, the Muslim world, while al-habs has been used uh, in the uh, North African, Sub-Saharan African, Africa, as well as in uh, Muslim Spain, the term habs would be seen and uh, would be documented in Islamic sources, while waqf would be documented in Eastern sources. Uh, similarly, there are instances where the term sadaqat is used in reference to the waqf. And sadaqat is our general category, but we find in Islamic sources in a in few instances where sadaqat is used uh, as a reference to the waqf and the establishment of waqf, even though the sadaqat in general could be translated as charities, uh, and therefore in this sense waqf would be designated as a type of charity, in this case ongoing charity that has not been, uh, that does not come to an end. Now as far as uh, the status or the position of waqf in Islamic law. Uh, Islamic law has designated waqf to be a permissible uh, uh, undertaking. And even though that we can say that the term waqf, habs, does not exist in the Quran. So if you look at the Quranic text to try to, drive, to, de to derive a specific uh, term, waqf and habs, it does not exist. But what we have is a large, <coughs> a large number of verses in the Quran that speaks of giving charity, of giving loan to Allah. Man qardan hasan. Who is it that will give to Allah a goodly loan? And lan tanalu birra hatta tunfiqu mimma tuhibbun. That you will not uh, derive or attain the birr, which is the highest form of goodness, until you spend from that which you like, which you love. And therefore we have a number of references that speaks of giving, of uh, extending charity and spending in the way of Allah. But specifically, we could say uh, that there isn't the term habs or waqf in the Quranic text. And in this sense, early on, some of the uh, uh, scholars and ulama in the early period of Islam did not actually authorize waqf. Uh, for example, Shurayh al-Qadi, Shurayh bin Harith al-Kindi, Qadi al-Kufa, is the uh, uh, Qadi of Kufa. Uh, he actually was appointed to the position of a judge during the time of Umar, Uthman, and Ali, as well as during the time of Muawiyah, continued to be the uh, judge over Kufa, and died in the year uh, 78 uh, of uh, the Islamic Hijri calendar, and 679 of the uh, Gregorian calendar, his statement says, لا حبس في كتاب الله. There is no uh, habs, there is no specific uh, mentioning of the term habs, and in this designating a habs or designating a waqf in the book of Allah. Uh, also Imam Abu Hanifa early on uh, said that the waqf has no asl or no foundation meaning that in the usul he did not find a foundation for it. It actually could, his stu own student Abu Yusuf would be credited with actually uh, issuing a very important uh, opinion that begins to uh, provide the grounding, the legal grounding for permissibility of awqaf. And he issued this based on his hearing of uh, Imam Malik عنه, uh, speaking about the waqf of Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, that he was that he set up during his time in uh, Medina. 
So in here, what we have early on is a debate upon between scholars whether actually Waqf is an, as an institution existed and whether it has any foundation in Islamic sources. There are also a debate about who was the first to have established Waqf in Islamic history. Uh, and interestingly in here, there is a, a split between Al-Ansar and Al-Muhajirun. Right? The Ansar say that the Prophet وسلم, is the first to have established Waqf. Uh, while the Muhajirun, the, uh, those who migra the, uh, the migrant ones, say that it's Umar ibn al-Khattab who actually was the first to establish Waqf. And each have their own uh, uh, indications or own sources. If we take that the Prophet ﷺ is the first to have established Waqf, uh, the Prophet actually have designated uh, uh, seven uh, uh, what's called basatin or seven enclosed uh, properties that are seven gardens in uh, the in Medina and these were from the wealth of Mukhayraq al-Yahudi, Mukhayraq the Jewish person who actually went to the battle of Uhud and died in the battle fighting on the sides of the Muslim and he gave a, uh, in his will that whatever uh, wealth he has uh, should be given to the Prophet Sallallahu and sure enough after the return uh, his family went ahead and uh, fulfilled the will and gave the uh, properties including the, se uh, the seven uh, enclosed gardens to uh, the Prophet and the Prophet set him and designated him as a waqf. Uh, also the Prophet had a number of uh, properties from Bani Nadir which was the battle of Bani Nadir what he gained he designated him as waqf. Uh, similarly there were three uh, uh, properties in Khaybar uh, that the Prophet also designated as Waqf. Uh, he had also half uh, from the property in Fadak, which uh, part of it also gets into the debate and discussion in relations to Fatima. Uh, one third from Wadi al Qura, which is also a property the, Prof the Prophet وسلم, had, and a location in the market in Medina. All these were properties that, according to the sources or according to the uh, opinion of the Ansar that the Prophet Sallallahu designated them as uh, Awqaf. Those who say Umar radiallahu an is the first to have set up uh, a waqf is that Umar radiallahu an uh, found that he or he uh, attained a land, a, an agricultural land uh, from the lands that he gained from Bani Haritha, the Jewish tribe of Bani Haritha in Medina. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is on the seventh year of the Hijrah, of what should I do with it? And in here we have the sources uh, that speak of this. Uh, we could find the source on this in Sahih al-Bukhari and uh, we could reference Sharh al-Bari on, uh, on al-Bukhari, uh, the seventh volume, two, page two, one, 201. Also an Nisa'i has it referenced. Uh, also the uh, commentary of an Imam al-Nawawi on Sahih Muslim. Uh, the 11th volume, page 85, Ibn Majah and Ibn Habban, uh, and also Ibn al Jawzi in his writing on Manaqib Umar. So, what we have is a variety of references that specifically address uh, that Umar, or at least ascribe to Umar, to be the first uh, who have established uh, a waqf in Medina around the seventh year of the Hijrah. Now, Umar is also in this text gives us the early indication of the articulation of the conditions of a waqf uh, property. And he said, uh, after he asked the Prophet Sallallahu what to do, the Prophet asked for him or informed him to establish it as a waqf. In shi'ta habasta aslaha, meaning if you desire to hold the principle, وَتَصَدَّقْتَ uh, بِهَا and to uh, give in charity the revenue. And Umar tasaddaq and he said, and la yuba'a asluha, that its principle is not to be sold, wala yuhab, and it's not to be given as a gift, wala yurath, and it's not to be given as an inheritance, and the expenditure is to be spent in al fuqara the poor, wal qurba, those who are closing kin, wal riqab, to free uh, those who are in, slave, in sta state of slavery, wa fi sabilillah, and in the cause of Allah. What life and the guest who's coming is to be allowed, and wala junaha ala man waliyaha and yakul minha bil maruf. And there is no uh, harm for the one who is overseeing it 
to eat from it أو يطعم صديقا غير متمول متمول فيه and to also to feed a friend who's coming upon the property but the one who's not seeking to actually draw benefit from it متمول meaning a friend who's not sitting in and basically trying to draw benefit uh, from it so all these this establishes the first text uh, of a waqfiyya which is the text that enumerate uh, what are the rules and regulations to be uh, found in the waqf. The first to actually oversee the, uh, this waqf uh, after Umar was Hafsa Ummul Mu'mineen. Hafsa the, dot, the uh, mother of the believers actually uh, oversaw her father's waqf and then after that the designation was to uh, those individuals from Al al Khattab, from the family al Khattab, to oversee uh, the, uh, the waqf that was set by uh, Umar radiallahu an. Uh, also, the sources speak about a, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu an to have set up a waqf, Uthman. Uh, Uthman actually uh, set up waqf in Syria and also set up the, uh, the village of Silwan in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Uh, to, for it to be expended upon uh, a, for the poor in Bayt al-Maqdis. And this is, appears in Yaqut al-Hamawi fi Mu'jam al-Buldan, uh, Yaqut al-Hamawi's book, Mu'jam al-Buldan, uh, third volume, page uh, three, uh, 341. Also, Zabir bin al-Awwam established waqf in Mecca and in Egypt. Uh, interestingly, Khalid bin al-Walid, who died not in a war, but rather in his bed, he actually set up all his armament and all his uh, weaponry and all of his protection as waqf to be used. Uh, in the sense of not being able to fight at an old age, he actually sent his uh, armament and all the tools that he used uh, to, uh, to be used for uh, the, uh, for, to be used in battles or in fighting as a waqf, so he could draw the benefits of that waqf. Uh, so as such, we could say that there are far more authoritative uh, support for waqf from the prophetic uh, statements, hadith in general, and from the practices of the early community, the, the Sahaba and al Khulafa al Rashidin's period, and not as much e explicit support in it from the Quran. So we, couldn't, we don't say that there is a, uh, a qat'i text in the Quran uh, to support, so it's essentially an ishtihadi matter uh, of trying to provide the support. And for those who studied usul, uh, you know the difference between an ishtihari matter where we don't have a qat'i text supporting it uh, from the Quran versus it's coming from an ishtihad. So we could say that uh, waqf and the authority behind, behind waqf came through an ishtihad matter and later on gained the consensus of the community uh, at a later point. Now, there are many conditions relative to uh, the waqf. Uh, and as such, you have a, uh, conditions that are attached to the one who is setting up the waqf, uh, conditions that are attached to that, to that which is to be designated as waqf, uh, also conditions that are attributed to the one who is receiving benefits from the waqf, as well as uh, conditions that have to be present for the waqf to be uh, distributed and uh, uh, undertaken. So I'm not going to go into these uh, aspects uh, and I think those who want to study uh, fiqh which engages in the fiqh of awqaf there are 10 conditions that in general uh, governs all these aspects uh, of waqf and there's uh, we could take a whole class just to speak about those conditions. The one conditions that I wanted to stop on is the condition of istibdal. Istibdal is an important condition because Often those who critique waqf look at istibdal and see the transgressions that have been undertaken through the use of istibdal. Istibdal literally, istabdala, right, what pattern in Arabic is the tenth pattern, istabdala yastabdilu al istibdal, right, meaning it's exchanging one property with another. Uh, there was Debates about it, some schools of Islamic jurisprudence will not allow istibdal, the Shafi'i don't allow istibdal, the Hanafi do uh, allow istibdal. Uh, in this sense, uh, at a variety of times, where the overseers of awqaf actually engaged in processes of istibdal to exchange one property for the other, but in the process, uh, 
really violating the basic texts that uh, set up this waqf uh, in the original state and essentially change it uh, to benefit themselves. And we have uh, many uh, instances in Islamic history of this taking place. Also through the process of istibdal, removing a property that was designated as waqf into private property. And then after changing it to private property, actually moving to own it uh, outright. And therefore we see uh, this violation. So in, the, in general, those who prohibited istibdal saw the weaknesses and saw the uh, harm that arises from uh, the process of istibdal and as such closed that door uh, to prevent the pretext uh, of individuals uh, close, uh, taking uh, public property or property that's been designated as well and uh, misusing it. Uh, Moving to the next larger issue is the types of waqf. There are in general two types of waqf that have been uh, at least uh, present in early Islamic history. One is awqaf amma, general waqfs, and awqaf darriya or family waqfs. So awqaf amma are general waqfs and awqaf darriya, family waqfs. There is a third which is combines both. It would be a, a waqf darri, meaning a family initiated work with the benefit being uh, sent to uh, the general public and that's a third category you could say it's in between both the waqf uh, awqaf amma and awqaf dharriya uh, early scholars have permitted the uh, treasury muslim treasury to actually use muslim uh, wealth and resources to buy properties and set them as a public waqf so we could find uh, that present in early Islamic history and I think this is the unique attribute of Islamic innovation right? and in here innovation in the positive not in the bid'ah right? uh, but unique innovation because it removed the state responsibility from being uh, engaged in the constant support of individual rather it provided for them uh, the institution of waqf to provide the social net, uh, the social uh, uh, safety net for the community and also gave them a considerable level or uh, a considerable level of freedom in engaging in the economic activity. Uh, this what we could say that the Muslim society was a social, uh, social welfare society but is not, was not a social welfare state. And there is an important distinction between a social welfare society and a social welfare state. In the social welfare state is the state that is the arbiter and the source of all the resources that are directed to uh, those in the society, needy and otherwise, and therefore the state has all the leverage and all the uh, responsibilities and all the resources and create a, level, a high level of dependency from the, from the uh, society to the state. In the awqaf process, it created a social, uh, a social structure outside of the state. Even though that the state was participant in creating these uh, general awqaf, it was the society being engaged in cooperative uh, relationship, and therefore it's a social welfare society where each part of the society is dependent on each other. Uh, there is a famous uh, saying where if you lived in the, in the later Ottoman state, you would have been born in a waqf uh, 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 hospital, uh, you would have lived in a waqf house, went to a waqf school, a gra prayed in a waqf mosque, uh, drank water from a waqf fountain, uh, uh, read from a book that is a waqf book, uh, if you died, you would have been, uh, actually you drank milk from a waqf uh, institution. If you died, you've been, wash, you've been washed and have your uh, uh, white shroud from a waqf institution and you were buried in a cemetery that was set up by a waqf. So basically from uh, birth to death, the waqf institution took care of you and also if you got sick, you went to a waqf hospital uh, that took care of you. All this without resorting to the state to get any of those benefits, rather it was a cooperative system. <coughs> also in thinking of social welfare society, 
that it made parts of the society dependent on each other, meaning each of these waqf institutions employed a large number of individuals. These individuals had relations to other parts of the society around them that are part of other institutions uh, of waqf in the, in the uh, territories, whether it's close or far from the central part of uh, the state. And therefore, it created almost an incentive to cooperate for the success and the maintenance of the waqf institution without the state intrusion uh, on many parts or many elements of the waqf as an institution and that's also it's unique and considering that we are here in the 20th century or 21st century where if you want to have any social welfare access you have to go to the state uh, or the nonprofit sector which is very thin in providing the overwhelming uh, resources for the society at this particular time in the islamic uh, uh, social welfare uh, model actually provided considerable flexibility and access uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this sense. So social welfare society versus social welfare state. And we're not using this language once again because there is a debate about social welfare state and important for us to critique it is actually to look at Islamic history and the institution of waqf and how it functioned uh, and because that was our unique contribution in the development of institutions covering all the needs of the society. We can say that it's only the Muslims who created uh, religious endowments because in early history we have societies that have created religious endowments. Otherwise how do you explain all the churches that were present in many parts of the world or any of the monasteries and so on. Our unique contribution to religious endowments is that we expanded the notions of endowment and created it into a whole functioning economy of codependence among various parts of the Muslim society and that's a unique contribution. Now having said that let me go and enumerate the types of waqfs that were set up during Islamic history. Uh, now it's obvious for many of us that the primary uh, energy for setting awqaf is a religious one. And it's not unique that uh, Muslims have set up religious endowments to begin with, meaning mosques and institutions of uh, worship uh, were set up as the earliest manifestation of waqf. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ uh, set up the, uh, his own mosque, which was a waqf in, in the sense, even though at the time it was set up, it was not spoken of as a waqf, but rather it was an institution for the general benefit of uh, the society. Uh, similarly, the Masjid Quba, likewise, would be a mosque that was set up. Uh, the Musul, there was a mosque in Musul that was set up in the 16th year of the Hijra. Uh, possibly one of the largest building of institutions uh, for worship is the Masjid Al-Aqsa, early on in Islamic history, uh, around the year 65 uh, of Hijra. Uh, as well as the expansion on the Haram in Mecca, in the Masjid al Nabawi and Masjid Quba, and the uh, mosque in Damascus around six, the year 68 uh, during the reign of Walid bin Abdul Malik. So that was all with the attempts to try to establish uh, institutions uh, that designated for worship. And that's the mosques and uh, the uh, uh, mosques and uh, masjids in general. What is unique is in these mosques and institutions is that there were properties that were added around it to provide the resources needed uh, to run these institutions. That's our unique contribution. In many, even in designing the uh, new cities where Muslims came, uh, at the center of the city, and this is where you know we speak about the Islamic epistemology of city, design at the center of the city was a mosque and that was the general mosque and from it came out various uh, alleyways and roads. Most of the properties around the mosque were designated as awqaf and those awqaf were used to run these institutions. So when you have markets, when you have stores, all these around the mosque uh, were actually the revenue accrued from it were directed to provide services and to provide uh, resources to run the mosque. 
Uh, now, <coughs> thinking about this for a moment, what it allowed, and I think uh, maybe right now we're speaking a different, what it allowed, it allowed a high level of religious freedom and independence for Muslim religious leadership. We don't think of it that way, because if we thought the religious institution uh, early on directly connected to the state, then it would be very difficult to have the independence of religious leadership. And when we get into the schools and the setup of awqaf schools, because that's also one of the largest contribution, it allowed the concept of academic freedom, which right now it's in vogue. Uh, that academic freedom was made possible by the disconnecting of the resources needed to fund these institutions, right? disconnected from the state and the uh, possibly the apparatus at a certain times of oppressive apparatus that would possibly prohibit it or prevented individuals from not only writing but critiquing and developing Islamic uh, uh, legal discourse, Islamic writing, Islamic history, and sometimes critiquing uh, at the highest level the uh, institutions of uh, leadership in Muslim, uh, in Muslim governance. And therefore, we could say that it allowed that independence to be there. It, it allowed it to uh, be unique, uh, not connected directly to government as an institution or to those who are funded. So the establishment of institutions, religious institutions, is one of those categories uh, that were funded by Awqaf. The second large category is the area of schools and universities. And I think in here, uh, Muslims were unique, not by means, uh, I don't like to always say we're number one. Uh, I don't think those, that terminology is appropriate, but in that sense, we had a unique uh, contribution to the development of schools. Uh, even though that early on the mosque, the mosque served as the institution to uh, provide learning, but by the second century of uh, the Islamic era, uh, we actually begin to see Schools, universities are specifically set with the exclusive uh, responsibility of teaching and instruction. Uh, that begins to take shape during the second uh, year of the Islamic uh, era uh, and culminate really in the fourth century and the fifth century, which are the pinnacle of building uh, institutions of learning uh, across uh, many parts of the world. Now, definitely Baghdad uh, gains the lion's share uh, during the early period of building or setting up institutions of higher learning and should be recognized so because the Abbasid seat of government was there. The revenue driven from all provinces and all institutions was coming in there and therefore there always uh, something to say about the central uh, dominion of a state it tends to have a greater rate of revenues uh, driving to it. And what we see is the establishment of these uh, schools. Uh, some of these schools had been uh, built from the ground up, like the Madrasa al Mustansiriya. And uh, in here, the Mustansiriya was seen as the model uh, of uh, an institution. Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziya said, Laysa fil Madina mithlu hadihi al Madrasa. Uh, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim in describing says there is nothing in the city like this school and there and there, nothing like it was built in the previous uh, years and it is in Iraq like the major mosque which is the Umayyad mosque in Damascus and the Qubbat al-Sakhra the Dome of the Rock in uh, Palestine. What we can say is that the model, and this is for us to recognize, that the model of architecture that al mustansiriya is built upon is the one that gets replicated and get to be used in other places. And this actually is the one that begins also to shape some of the architecture in uh, Muslim Spain. And therefore, this courtyard with water fountains, with uh, flowers, greenery, that actually begins in Baghdad and then finds its way in other places. So what we right now today we say is 
Spanish architecture actually owes its contribution, its formulation from the early period of Islamic school building, which is a school in, in Baghdad. And if you go to some of the uh, institutions that we have here in the United States that have the distinctive uh, Spanish architecture, if you go to St. Mary's College up in Moraga, it definitely have that feel to it. That was the idea of building uh, these institutions. At the center of many of these institutions was a mosque, a center courtyard, large courtyard, uh, that was built, ornamented, and uh, uh, having greenery and places that are there. So in here we could say the contribution not only in terms of the institution itself as an institution of learning, but the aesthetics that go with the school uh, that contributed, that Muslims early on contributed uh, to it. Uh, in these schools, actually, there were enumeration of the uh, different payments that are to be paid. It is in this period that al Mustansiriya and uh, this uh, period of Islamic, uh, uh, by the uh, 5th century, uh, we begin to actually get allocation, designated allocations to be given to teachers, something that we are all familiar with, but the concept of financial aid to students. Actually, the students are given financial aid, uh, given a place to live, uh, right, considering our dorms in here, definitely we need to improve on them. Uh, also, the presence of Mu'id, which is the most advanced students, will teach and provide review of the lessons to, uh, the, uh, to the students who are less advanced. Uh, also, something they have, Katib al ghaiba meaning that there was a student or somebody that is responsible to go around and take the attendance. Uh, and that was an actual position that is paid. And also in the hadith class, uh, there is a person who writes, who is present and who is absent, to authenticate the transmission. Because if somebody say, yes, I got a ijaza because I was in such and such class, they'll go and check with Katib Ghaybat al-Sami'een, the one who is responsible to record who was present and absent from these classes to authenticate the isnad. Because how do we know that somebody actually uh, heard or listened from someone and how did they get the transmission? Because the highest form is sama'. Meaning that the teacher is reading and the student is listening and at the end of each lesson there is a recording of a sami'in who was present in the lesson. All right, so there is actually a position for that. Then there was Shaykh al Riwaya, he, that's a designated position. And this is for us is important Al Munshid, the one who actually is going in Shad, uh, reciting uh, with a, a, in a choir way the uh, poetry in praise of the Prophet. And uh, in essence, it's someone that specifically is within the institution. And then another, which would be the general manager or the, the uh, director. And then there are a whole bunch of more of the full khidmat, meaning individuals who are responsible for the services, other services within the institution. Each one of this was given a salary, a uh, place to live, and a responsibility within the institution. And they were looked upon as highly placed uh, within uh, the Muslim uh, society. Ibn Kathir, <laughs> this is interesting, he said in terms of the Mustansiriya, in thamanat تبن الوقف يكفي المدرسة وأهلها. That the cost of tibn, which is the uh, food that you give to the horses and to the sheep and so on, tibn. Right? He said the price of the tibn, meaning that which is fit to the animal, is enough to run the school and all those who are in it. So that shows you how much actually the infrastructure of the school to support it uh, in terms of uh, resources. Uh, and uh, another one was uh, described in Mustansiriya. He says, "Lam yu'raf mawda' akthar minha awqafan, wala arfaha minha sukkanan." There isn't there isn't a place that is uh, more than it in awqaf set up for it, or nor in terms of enjoyment or raf meaning enjoyment or ease of life uh, for those who are its inhabitants. Uh, so that's how the schools at least were, uh, were treated and dealt with in this period. 
The type of schools and the type of institutions that were set up, there were uh, schools for Quran, specifically specialized in Quran. There were schools specialized in Hadith. Uh, in one reference around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, during the period of Imam Al-Ghazali, when he wrote Ihya Al-Ulum Al-Din, there are close to 250 schools around surrounding uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So you, in each of one of these major mosques, you had a number of these uh, uh, institutions, not only uh, schools in the higher level, but Quran school, Hadith school, a school specifically for young boys, uh, for orphans, for poor people. There are also uh, places for young kids, children, uh, where actually children, right now we have uh, Childcare, which is actually, is they just put the TV in front of you and basically you become cyclop at early on. But these were actually early on, the kids are given uh, a place where they uh, are uh, given some support and some uh, early teaching uh, and then they move into the uh, next level. Uh, one also, one unique contribution for the Muslims is the establishment of uh, libraries. Uh, that also was a unique feature. Uh, in terms of uh, Muslims' development of libraries. And uh, for example, Nidam al-Mulk set up his library, uh, which called it Khazanat al-Nidamiyya, and he set up 6,000 uh, volumes in it, in its initial inception. Uh, now this is uh, in, the f in the sixth century of Islamic era, uh, 1,139 of, the, of our uh, common era. So 6,000, and then Al-Khalif al-Nasr li dinillah literally a few years thereafter added to it 10,000 books more. So it was started with 6,000 and then adding to it another uh, 10,000. Uh, the library of Al-Mustansiriya, uh, it was set up by Al-Mustansir Billah. Uh, he carried to it, when he started it, uh, 160 camel worth of books that were uh, brought to fill its, uh, uh, its shelves, and, <coughs> and the total number of books that was counted in it was 80,000 books. Uh, so this is, once again, we're talking about the 12th century uh, of having 80,000 uh, books. Uh, Madrasa al-Bashiriya, also in Baghdad, al uh, Mustasim Billah uh, created it, uh, established it, uh, 60, uh, 36, large boxes of books were brought to it for its inception. Uh, so these are uh, uh, massive libraries that were set up at the, uh, at the time. Al-Madras al-Fadiliya library in Egypt, uh, Al-Qadi al-Fadil uh, established it. Uh, Ibn al-Jawzi said that he set up 100,000 books in its foundation. So when he founded it, 100,000 books were set up in it. Uh, the Al-Zahiriya uh, library, which was set up by Zahir Vipers, uh, also uh, said that we can't enumerate its books, but constantly it's adding to its book uh, collection. Uh, so you have a, almost across the Muslim uh, 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 landmass from Spain all the way to the borders of uh, China, the establishment of libraries, and I think Many of us in here are right now recipient of some of these books, even though that the bulk of the books were uh, lost during the pillage of Baghdad. Uh, but we still are seeing some of these books and some of these materials. It's a true testament uh, to the importance of Waqf and what it did in preserving not only our own knowledge, but many books from other civilizations and other uh, communities, and especially in, the, in Baghdad, uh, not only they set up libraries, but went on the task of translating existing knowledge and making it possible for people to share. And all of that was done by means of waqf, by means of endowment. Uh, there are a whole area of awqaf pertaining to jihad. I'm not gonna uh, discuss this, not because we're worried about the term jihad, but I think for our own purposes right now, it's a whole discussion and a whole enumeration of what was uh, set up, but there is a category uh, of setting up awqaf for jihad. And I think what we want is to focus more on education and on all issues that have provided sustainable development. Uh, next, I would focus on 
what is an area of that's where social development and sustainable development that Awqaf were set up. Uh, now one, uh, and I'm going to enumerate the type of Awqaf that were set up, uh, setting up what's called houses uh, for people actually to live in. Uh, family set up Awqaf also uh, at a certain periods in Islamic history also uh, uh, caliphs, their wives, their uh, uh, elite set up uh, houses for people, uh, build them, improve them. Uh, sometimes often after floods or major crisis they would come in and build these houses. So there were many awqaf properties that were set up in, firm, in terms of houses. Second, Dur al-Diyafa. Uh, diyafa meaning actually places where people can be given uh, diyafa to feed. Not in sense of the uh, poor and needy, they have institutions that serve them, but actually for somebody who's come in, especially travelers would come in and they would be given uh, the appropriate needs. Uh, as a daif. And in general, uh, uh, not only in terms of Arabic history, but Islamic history in particular, the daif has a right upon you. And therefore, those rights were also embedded in uh, how Muslims see, uh, dealt with awqaf and setting up awqaf, so much so that they set up an actual place in uh, cities where uh, diyafa could be taken and where travelers could come and stay a number of days. Uh, uh, until their needs are met. Uh, also the setting up of uh, bread and food, uh, in particular directed toward the poor, and there were awqaf that uh, still up to this day, uh, there is a awqaf across the Muslim world, and in particular the food, the soup kitchen, the concept of the soup kitchen has been present in Islamic history from the earliest period. Uh, even today, and I, this is for a fact, if you go to the city of Al Khalil, uh, which is in Palestine, Hebron, right? In, uh, if you go there, there's still an ongoing uh, waqf of soup that is served to people who come to visit the um, uh, grave of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is a waqf that dates back to the time of Tamim bin Aws al Dari, uh, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu who's from Palestine, and the Prophet gave him a, and his brothers, a waqf in the city of Al Khalil and its surroundings, and the waqf is still ongoing till today. And if you go to many other cities in Damascus, in Baghdad, uh, in uh, New Delhi, in many places, you'll find the uh, providing bread, you're providing soup is part and parcel. And also, sometimes, where also Sufi uh, uh, zawiyas have always had food and uh, had soup and bread as part and parcel of their. Uh, of their contribution. Uh, next we had uh, the uh, awqaf directed to uh, the orphans. Uh, so there were institutional awqaf for the orphans as well as those who are, uh, uh, you know, what we could say street kids, al-luqata, meaning those who have uh, either left their parents or there are no, uh, no one to account for. Uh, also there are places where these are, uh, uh, there's awqaf directed to them. Uh, next, there were awqaf that was set up in Baghdad, in Cairo, and in Damascus that actually uh, took in and addressed the needs of al-mutallaqat, those divorced women, and al-mahjurat, those who were abandoned by their husbands. Uh, so early on, a waqf that would address their needs and they would go there, uh, so much so that uh, some of these waqfs, because of the piety that was present in there, uh, that people actually will come to seek marriage from those who are there because of the high level of uh, piety and attention that they were given. Uh, further, also, we had another category of waqf, Dur al Aramil, uh, the widowed women uh, who would not have uh, someone to support them. There were houses that were set uh, in there in Mecca. Ribat al Fiqa'iyya fi Mecca, it was actually set up for specifically the Aramil in the year 492 of the Hijrah, uh, where those widowed will actually uh, be able to uh, go there. Waqf al Amyan, the waqf that was intended for the blind, and their, the needs are uh, fulfilled, and uh, their needs are attended to. Uh, also, there were a waqf for al hili wal Malabis, uh, ornaments, uh, jewelry, and clothing. This actually, the Waqf was set up initially by Umm al-Mu'mineen Hafsa. The uh, mother of the believer Hafsa set up this waqf specifically 
for uh, uh, brides who can't afford the ornaments and the dress. And as such, he wanted for them to have these ornaments and dress and dresses available to them. And she said it, so she would, she's accredited uh, for actually providing this work. Also, there is work for animals. Uh, there was work for taking care of stray, stray dogs in both Damascus and in Baghdad, as well as a work to take care of birds uh, who either had injured wings or injury, that there were actually uh, a work for them. A work to provide milk for, uh, for uh, nursing or for uh, families that don't have milk. They actually will come and fill their uh, jars with milk in general, so those were uh, specifically uh, uh, waqfs that were set up for this. However, in Mecca, there was a waqf to try to stop dogs from entering into the city of Mecca to try to preserve its sacredness. Uh, so in here, if you have, let's say, somebody who's trying to get back at Muslims, say how Muslims hate dogs, he will go to that waqf and he say, you see, they are so uh, insensitive to dogs, they don't want dogs to come into Mecca as a sign of uh, lack of attention to animals and then those who want to go into the positive go in this. In general, every one of these walks had a particular understanding of particular intention, it comes from a particular epistemology and Muslims set up certain things because it meets how they see the world and how they see their relations. So in both cases we have to say that there is support for both in uh, relations to uh, the works that were set up. Uh, here's one of the unique ones which I think those who are part of the Occupy Wall Street would like. Uh, Nuruddin Zinki uh, actually uh, set up a palace uh, as a uh, work for the poor. Uh, he said he in Rabwat Dimashq in a very uh, uh, affluent area of Damascus he saw many of the rich are inhabiting palaces and uh, high property, so he actually say it should not be only them that would, that would benefit from this. So he set up a palace in there uh, for the poor to actually be living in it and benefit from it. And uh, Sha'ar Tajuddin al Kindi wrote a two lines, or more than this, but two lines that stood out in relations to this. He said, "In Nur al Dini, lama an ra'a fi al Basatini qusur al Agniya." عمر الربوة قصرا شاهقا نزهة مطلقة للفقراء. That when Nur al-Din saw that the basatin, meaning those uh, gardens with fruits and so on, uh, are all filled with palaces for the rich, he constructed uh, in the Rabwa a mighty or a, you know, huge palace. Uh, نزهة meaning a place for uh, to seek. Uh, relaxation, repose for uh, the poor ones. So in here, once again, it's to conceptually to think about uh, how we see the spatial separation between poor and rich. So in here is actually what's called interrupting the spatial separation by imposing a particular understanding in this, by setting up a place where the poor can come among the rich. So the spatial, the spatial separation cannot be uh, maintained. Uh, similarly, there was, as I said earlier, a waqf for the washing and uh, providing the coffin for the uh, deceased Muslims as well as burying them and also for those who are not Muslim but happened to die that their attention to them also uh, was uh, included. Al-Muntazahat, uh, uh, which would be parks, they're actually uh, setting parks as waqf and the early Reference to it is actually from the year 147 of the Islamic era, which would be 790. Uh, the first uh, such park is established by Mansur Muwalla Isa bin Ja'far al Abbasi, so it's an early period of the Abbasi. He set up a, a lake and all its surrounding in Baghdad for people to uh, benefit from, and therefore the setting up of a park uh, for the general benefit. Uh, bridges and uh, pass pass passageways also were set up as awqaf. Uh, one of the areas where you had considerable contribution is water, right? setting up water system and water uh, services uh, in general. Uh, these were major contribution because at least the uh, presence or the status of water uh, was very important. 
So that category really have served as a social institution that if you look at it, it's providing almost every aspect of need, human need in the society and the government is not the agency that is responsible to it. The last part, and then I will try to uh, wrap up and get you to have your questions, is the whole area of uh, public health right, in hospitals. Uh, if there is a unique contribution that is distinctively belongs to Muslims, it's, set up, it's the setting up of a hospital. Right? The setting up of hospital goes back to uh, uh, Islamic uh, institutional building and the institution that was built as early as uh, 158 uh, of the Islamic era and some actually put it in an earlier period but you could date it to the second century of the Islamic era where the hospital as an institution begins to take shape. Now, even though that early on when we find the sources that many Islamic references uses the term Bimarstan, Bimar, Bimarstan, which is a Persian term that has been used in the Islamic uh, text, uh, this should not be used to indicate that the Muslims or early Muslims uh, have borrowed the hospital institutions from the Persians because we don't find references to hospital as an institution uh, in the early Persian uh, uh, empire or in this matter the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so the borrowing of the word does not indicate a borrowing of the institution. Uh, and therefore, even there are terms in the Quran that originates from early uh, civilization. Uh, but we also see the term Mustashfa, uh, which is the, uh, based on the 10th pattern, Mustashfa, right? Yastashfi al Mustashfa comes from it. And also Dar al Marda, the house of the sick, or Dar al Shifa the house of cure, which was more preference than Dar al-Marda uh, in, in, in its usage. Now Baghdad has the lion's share early on in the building of hospitals. In Baghdad, during the fourth century of the Islamic era, there were actually five fully functioning hospitals in the city. And uh, at least a number of them had a fully functioning school, medical school attached to it. All right, so this is in the uh, fourth century of the Islamic era, you actually had uh, five hospitals uh, with a, uh, a, an educational institution attached to at least three that uh, we have record of, and also having dispensary of medicine. So the hospital at least had all uh, these elements to it. Uh, the Mustashfa Im al Muqtadir, uh, its monthly uh, its monthly expenses were 600 dinar. 600 dinar, which would be the gold, 600 uh, dinar, gold dinar. Mustashfa uh, al Muqtadiri, its monthly uh, expenditure were 200 dinar uh, in general. And uh, one of the first to have led the five hospitals. So, what you have is a chief uh, medical person uh, actually overseeing the five hospital. Uh, uh, simultaneously Sinan bin Thabit. So Sinan bin Thabit was supervising the five hospitals which requires a considerable level of administrative uh, or supervision to be able to uh, supervise the five hospitals as well as medical schools attached to it and uh, also dispensary of uh, medicine. Uh, similarly at a later on uh, the Baghdad in Baghdad uh, Al-Razi becomes the major uh, uh, physician responsible for the hospital and the institutions of hospitals in Baghdad. Uh, so what you have in here is an institution uh, that is self-supporting, that has a structure, educational structure attached to it, which would be a specialized medical instruction that are taking place and uh, also expenditures in there. Another use of the term unique is that uh, patients did not have to pay to actually uh, uh, get access to uh, health care. Right? Uh, so at least uh, we could say that we were at more advanced than Obamacare uh, in this constant and uh, it was open to all and one would raise the question how did they pay for all of this? Right? Because at least all of us right now is like I can't find my money from this pocket it goes out the other pocket and this is where the institution of Waqf it provided facilities outside, it provided land, agricultural land, where the revenues that are 
uh, brought from these lands are driven to, to provide support for these institutions. Uh, markets, so instead right now where we have all these malls that are getting that are developed by corporations benefiting the one or two that own the corporation. Many of these markets were set up as waqf. They are rented to individuals to operate their business, but the monthly rent goes on to a public benefit in the sense of waqf. And therefore it created a codependent economy where everyone is dependent on, meaning the merchant is wanting to be honest in their uh, engagement in the market doesn't mean that Muslims don't have any cheese they do but there is a religious ethos at the center of the market at the center of the agriculture at the center of the interaction that made it possible for all these institutions not only to thrive but actually to provide high quality uh, services across the board and I think for us to not only think about it nostalgically but how for us to think how we could do the same or at least not only the same because we cannot recreate history, what we could say is learn from it and to see how we could shape our modern awqaf because that's what we need and we here at Zaytuna were attempting to set up an awqaf because this university is a waqf uh, for the benefit of Muslims and therefore to learn from these institutions how to set up these awqafs for us and how to, uh, for us to create this social welfare uh, society among us uh, so we actually could take of each other needs, everyone can contribute and that is the challenge for us today because we have the resources but our resources do not have the ability to regenerate and recreate additional synergy between all the Muslim communities and I think that is the challenge that faces. I don't have answers but I pose these as a possibilities for us to think of how to do it and how to bring about sustainable economic development through the awqaf and I think many of us can put our heads together in order for us to do so. And uh, look forward to your questions, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. So, feel free. Uh -huh. Well, we, each, each generation has its own challenges. The question was about what are the challenges that are facing us today uh, in trying to recreate some of these models and what were the challenges then. Uh, each generation has its own challenges, so I'm not drawing a rosy picture in general. Uh, there are, I said early on, you know, when I spoke about istibdal, that was definitely an area where people were uh, taking things for granted and using istibdal as a way of putting their hands on awqaf. Uh, every time there were a political upheaval and change in uh, uh, political leadership among the Muslims, certain parts of the Muslim uh, leadership will take their hands and put their hands on the awqaf. Uh, even during the late Ottoman era, as the Ottoman became more indebted, uh, they tried to uh, take control of the awqaf and that's where you get the whole ministry of awqaf that was inherited by the nationalists and the nationalists uh, went ahead with the same type of rationale that has been that existed in early on in Islamic history. Uh, so that's saying those are some of the challenges. Uh, I think our primary challenge today and I think uh, maybe you agree with me on that, that we enter into the market with a capitalist mindset. And therefore, we have a capitalist mindset, but we put Bismillah on top of it. And then we ask, what will be the results? Uh, capitalism is about not having a deep belief that Allah is a razzaq. We believe that Wall Street is a razzaq. And there is no, to put them in the same sentence is an insult, but that's what you find considerable part of Muslim uh, point of view is rooted in this aspect of thinking uh, in a capitalist things, and that's where you get many writings, says uh, Islam is a market economy, and all those uh, aspects, once again, prevents us from thinking outside the box, because once you're inside the box, you just can only see the walls of the box, and that's limitation. So that's one. Second, uh, we have, we're just such, in terms of diversity, we just have a diverse community and our challenge is how to bring that diversity into a form of cohesive unity. In the earlier generations they were able to overcome that 
we had Shu'ubiyya, we had all kinds of uh, conflicts, but how to bring that into a form of unity, then we could produce collectively, because each one of us have a unique window into the world. That unique window is rightly theirs by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a challenge that we still have to face. Uh, third uh, is how to create a successful model. Because until you don't provide a successful model, it's very difficult, but still it's theoretical. And I think we have to take the next step to create a successful model and begin to uh, articulate it in a real way. And I often use uh, uh, cheese board, right? great, great pizza, and Erz Mendy. Right? They have same, same ownership, they have two stores in Oakland, and one, in, one in Oakland, one in Emeryville, and then one on Shattuck. It's a cooperative. Right? The uh, employees own the institution itself, they have certain contribution that they have to do in terms of work and they share in terms of the profit. So even within the capitalist model, there's a break away from it and creating something unique. And my question for us is where is, where is our cheese you know, board, right? And we have to be able to create that and then replicate it in a successful way. So those are for me the three challenges. Can I add a fourth? Oh, Bismillah. I think a fourth would be the hegemonic nation nature of the nation state that doesn't allow for any economic activity that will create a center that, or social, True. that will rival or allow the development <coughs> of independent centers of power. No, no, that's, that's good. Imam Zaid just, I'm just uh, reporting, said we could add forth to it the hegemonic nature of the nation state and not allowing uh, counter centers of economic and social activities. That's correct. I agree with you on that. Any? Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate a little bit more about the education? Like what kind of schools were there? Uh, was the education systemic or systematic or you know, did it differ within regions? Like how did it work? Well, er early, well early on in the development it was rudimentary, but as we get into the fourth and fifth century, there was a set curriculum uh, there were also stage developments, so there is an early schooling which uh, used to focus on Quranic uh, memorization, understanding of the Quran, then you move on to fiqh and the various other uh, sources, uh, and then you move into higher learning or higher education, and then at a certain point specialization. Uh, similarly, there were uh, institutions that uh, were specialized, for example, when we said the hospitals had uh, uh, teaching schools, so you go to there after you finish some of the uh, preliminary uh, teaching and schooling that you have done. Uh, so there was a structure, there was a set curriculum, there was a uh, mechanism for uh, testing, uh, there was a formal ijaza system, right? And I think these days we think of ijaza as something ornamented, Right. I got an ijazah, so on, but it's really an ijazah is to certify that you have attained the prerequisite knowledge, the prerequisite adab, and you are qualified to transmit and teach in that way. So that ijazah was there. Uh, 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 teachers were required to attain certain level of uh, education and be qualified to teach, and they were ranked. So there was a rank within the teaching uh, cadres that you had in these schools and as such it was professed uh, early on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sorry. I just have a question in regards to um, your comment about religious freedom and academic freedom that was provided to mosques and um, you know, educational institutions. I'm wondering if you could refer to um, state, uh, the freedom from you know, state. The freedom from the state. Not necessarily administration, you know, or general No, no. Well, administration, there, there definitely there was rivalry, sectarian rivalries. A Hanafi mosque will not allow a Shafi'i to come. But it was not a state intrusion into uh, the institution. So rivalries exist uh, uh, throughout history, continue to exist today. But you did not get the, uh, let's say, the khutbah or the lesson from the desk of the Khalifa or the desk of Minister of Awqaf as we get today. And these are the specifically what you need to do. That, that did not happen and it was not present. Uh, so that's what unique, it allowed, or at least provided, the, the institutions to have their own ability 
even in antagonistic relationship to other sects or other groups, but they did that internally to their own, uh, uh, to their own understanding and their own uh, view. Uh, more so also, and I think this is something unique, is to think how Islamic law was completely developed outside of the confines of the state. Uh, law in general, states would like to have exclusive dominion over the law. In this case, the law was completely educated, adjudicated, argued, debated, uh, codified outside of the confines of the state. That is unique in Islamic history. Even though the state showed favor to one school or the other, but showing favor is different than actually dictating to the school of what can and cannot. And I think the record of the legal opinions that are present in uh, our collections of fatwas from various areas, whether it's the Fatawa Shamiya or Fatawa Ahl Maghrib or Fatawa Al India, just illustrates uh, the uh, complete almost uh, challenge uh, to the state and its leadership by many of these legal opinions. Well, in terms of the codependence, it's like we are in in any so in any setting, we have to have the basic assumption that I need you as much as you need me in the economy, and I cannot make my wealth by robbing every penny that you have in your pocket. So, maximizing profit does not mean it's a healthy society. In our contemporary uh, process is that the more money you have, the more quote unquote successful you are. No attention whether you robbed your uh, mosque, synagogue or church, whether you took the money from underneath the elderly and you ran to the bank and to the casino. Uh, there is no consideration whether you're feeding people pink slime and pass it as healthy food. Right? All these considerations uh, completely from our world of view is not something that we should support or engage. So codependence is I, my life is dependent on you and your life is dependent on me. And the economy and the structures and the institutions we formulate have that at the center of their articulation. That's the epistemology they emerge from. But if the epistemology is maximizing profit, then you're going to have this disjointed this process that emerged that we call the modern economy, that we call globalization, privatization, that uh, the bottom line is how much profit can I drive toward me uh, at the expense of everyone else. And I only respond to the market if the market finds something wrong, if they all of a sudden find that I radio radioactivated every part of my food because it's cheaper, because it doesn't get rotten on the shelf for the next 15 years. Once people discover that, then I respond. So the ethics that are in the market is the ethics of maximizing profit. So codependence means that the relationship have to be based on that. And awqaf institutions actually make it possible for us to do that. Right? Because every part of the society, if we have these awqaf, you need to have a farm, but the farmer is actually producing because they need to support the school. And the school is set up in order to graduate some of the students and kids and produce books and materials to uh, everyone else and produce those who are going to fulfill possibly uh, various administrative functions and uh, possibly address some of the needs. The merchant is going to sell and, and buy. He's going to also attend to asking questions and uh, show favor to uh, other parts of the society. Uh, those who are poor, the orphans need to be taken care of because it's not their fault or their uh, situ their situation is not a result of their own and a society is judged by how it deals with the least able in the society not by how it treats those who are most able at least in setting up these awqaf it shows that Muslims were thinking that it's those who are least able that the society directed its energy to address and solve not to try to constantly address those who are most wealthy or those who are shown favor uh, in the courts of governance. Oh, quickly and then I'll take your question. <laughs> I'm wondering if within the Oqaf system there was a certain consciousness or thinking about um, ways to alleviate like poverty and things 
things like that? You know, like, was there sort of just an understanding that there would always be the poor, or was there some sort of initiative within the system? Well, many of these places were had some uh, training in them. So it's not a matter of that you just brought the orphans and you set them in there without anything. The orphan house had schooling, so there will be school, they had Quranic memorization, they had some uh, possibilities of work, and therefore there was an, in, an at least an, in, not an incentive, but a structure to move people out of poverty. But not condemning poverty because of it being po in a state of poverty. Because in, ha in essence, how to make people whole is the whole framework of awqaf, that it treated individuals as dignified human beings, that they are in a state of weakness because of a variety of reasons, and that state of weakness should not prohibit them from moving up and becoming uh, scholars, merchants, uh, contributors in the society. And that's, I think, our unique uh, feature. The Prophet ﷺ actually always favored giving people the way, uh, possibility to earn a living. And we have the famous hadith or the famous story where the Prophet ﷺ, somebody asks him and he, gives, he, he actually gives him an axe and tell him to go and uh, cut woods and sell it. And therefore what he's teaching them is how to fish. So these institutions were teaching people how to fish. It's not only providing them uh, fish without any uh, you know, possibility of moving from one state to the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so well, there were two different, two different types of institutions. So the institutions that were directed specifically for the poor and uh, the, the orphans, it had a specific mission and that's the mission. Now you might have somebody who's poor who will go to a different school because somebody either sponsored them or their sadaqa and so on took care of them. But those different types of institutions were present. So you had a specific institutions that their mission was to take care of the orphans. Right? So that were its uh, major, uh, major uh, initiative and their major institutional framework. Does not mean they discriminate. Uh, I, you know, I wouldn't say that if somebody came who's not orphan and said, I want to study in the school that is predominantly orphan, say, no, 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 you have to be orphan first, so get, become orphan and come back to us. Uh, so these variety of institutions provided a large safety net that address the, the various uh, needs or the various interests of the society. Now, if somebody was rich and went to a school, most likely they would contribute to the institutions in a manner of gifts or showing favor to the teachers and so on. So there was that uh, institutional framework as well. The mosques or hospitals, for instance, you know, they didn't really discriminate. Like no, no, hospitals, they... Like you have concepts of um, awqaf that exist without, you know, without really Yeah, yeah, we said that there's a general awqaf, and then there's these old types of awqaf that were running simultaneously. Right? Mosques would not discriminate structurally. However, sectarian, you know, pres Islamic history has sectarians, and so we're not going to gloss over that. But the institution itself was founded to address the public interest and the public needs. There was actually a big debate during the, er, the mid-period of the Ottomans about cash uh, endowments. And uh, there was a variety of opposition to cash endowments because one, they were worried if the currency changes and your endowment is held in that currency, what happens? So there was a big debate back and forth, but essentially uh, they allowed and permitted uh, setting up an endowment in terms of cash uh, and accruing the returns from it uh, into uh, supporting the various awqafs. Uh, and these endowments was to invest with merchants where the merchants are given uh, parts of the cash awqaf and agreeing on a certain return uh, based on Islamic contractual agreements. So that was present. And I think we have enough support within Islamic, at least history, for the past 400 years or so, that to set up an endowment 
where the accrued return from that cash endowment goes to support the institution. So Zaytuna, in the long run, its success or failure will be contingent upon the endowment uh, that we uh, set up uh, to support the uh, institutions. Uh, in general, uh, even in the contemporary period, no institution of higher learning uh, can sustain itself uh, solely on student fees or tuition. Even the highest university, where you Stanford or uh, Harvard, their tuition only take care of maybe at maximum 20, maybe 30 percent of their uh, costs. So 70 percent of uh, the budgetary need of institutions uh, actually is driven from endowment, awqaf, and I think this is where our institution have to be in the long run, and that's where we are on a campaign to build this endowment. Just think about it. If, let's say, at the Nizamiyya in Baghdad or the Mustansiriya, at Friday they f found out that they have no budget uh, to take care of the students, to take care of the teachers, to take care of the needs, and they had to go after Friday and stand up on the member and say, we need to meet the salary needs of this, uh, it would not be sustainable. They might be able to do it one week, but then the next week, the third week, af after three or four or five times, people just say, you know what, it's just your, your ship is not sailing with the right direction. So endowment is fundamental uh, of providing uh, the institutional support for uh, institutions, not only of higher learning, but education in general. The other part is that education in itself is very difficult. You're not buying and selling. It's not like you could put what you call a small uh, uh, alcove outside and you sell Kit Kat and uh, drinks and so on to make the budget. Most you are building human beings, right? And saying building is very problematic, but you're actually developing individuals' understanding, and then they go out, and you never see the fruits immediately. It might take 20 years for a fruit that graduated from here to actually make it. Some might not make it at all. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you actually are expending considerable resources to read books, right? to read books, write books, comment on books, take tests in relations to books. So our daily exchange, you don't have a monetary, what you call, cash box. Say, okay, I taught you 200 words today, so 200 words times $3, so you owe me $600. I'll take $600 from you per day. We don't have that. And therefore, individuals who understand the importance of education understand that they're actually investing in the foundation of the society and investing in building the society in general because an educated person contributes to a healthy society and that's why I like the bumper sticker on Telegraph if you think education expensive try ignorance <laughs> <laughs> right? so uh, there's extreme truth to it right I don't get a cut from uh, <laughs> promoting bumper sticker from Russ who embraced Islam on the 9-11, after 9-11, came out on Sproul Plaza and then joined us in Friday prayers. So, may Allah give, bless, bless him for his work. Any other questions? Najib, I, I see you in here and you don't ask any question. That's <laughs> betraying your uh, journalistic background. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Were there, and were there safeguards in place in terms of uh, the influence of big money, the, uh, the influence of the money, in, in terms of obviously, like, you know, if, if the state is funding, you know, you have to guard against the influence of the state or the influence, but in terms of private money, were there safeguards? You well, know, touched on that, I know. When, when you register a waqf, you actually, the registration was made that you registered with the judge. So the judge and the judiciary establishment became the overseer of the awqaf. And this is not only to prevent <coughs> the possible external influence, but also to make sure that the uh, waqf tax that was set up is at least adhered to uh, in principle and not allow uh, manipulation. So much so that they actually uh, specified in a uh, number of legal texts that you should not leave space between the lines of the waqf when you're writing it, so somebody cannot insert 
right? A whole line in between if there is space. So if you wrote it with too much margin between the uh, uh, lines, they'll actually send you to write it at close so there will not be enough space to write another line that might violate the intent or the directions that are there. So there was actually a whole process of registration of the waqf and for you to change any aspect of waqf, you had to go to the judge and uh, get a, judici a, judici a, ju a judiciary ruling on how a particular aspect of the waqf needs to be uh, changed or uh, altered. Once again, doesn't mean that people did not violate it. So we don't want to always create this rosy picture that Muslims were just you know, on a straight path and straight line. We have instances, and you could document those instances of individuals uh, making, making it possible for uh, manipulating the uh, awqaf, manipulating what the intent of the waqf is. And the, more, the most important one would be the one, the overseer of the waqf, he has considerable authority. And as such, that's where the, uh, the overseer responsibility uh, becomes very critical. So as we think about structures today, those are the things that we need to pay attention to. What are the guidelines and requirements for the overseer? What they can and cannot do? Uh, needing more than one signature to authorize a particular uh, understanding. Having a board, right, that oversee the awqaf. And this is early on from Islamic history. There, there was called majlis, a, a board that oversaw particular types of awqaf. Those aspects have to be uh, put in place, uh, but there's no such thing as 100% uh, uh, foul proof. Why? Because we're humans, and humans uh, are uh, essentially always apt to find a loophole, uh, Muslim or otherwise, and therefore we have to constantly guard ourselves uh, against those possibilities because they will happen. Okay, just uh, last question then before. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an area of mu'amalat, yeah. Where it would be anything would be permissible as long as there, was, there wasn't um, something specific. Mm -hmm. it. It's mu'amalat and also it's ishtihadi, right? So uh, meaning that there are issues that are always going to evolve that you need to have a ruling about, that you need to constantly engage in. So I imagine that these rulings that were developed by the fuqaha in the past pertain to its um, operation in the context of Islamic government. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, how that would be managed by you know the, their government. Sure. And I'm sure we're um, like when we think about it, we have to think about it in terms of our own um, like judicial, uh, like in our context, judicial system is going mm -hmm. to um, pertain to Islam. So how can we benefit from these institutionalized or these like the history of the, um, these um, rulings and this um, around this institution in our context? In the U.S. In the US. Well, there's a number of authors who say that the development of modern endowment and uh, trusts, living trusts and otherwise, uh, had contrib considerable influence from the Muslim period. Uh, now whether that's right or not, we'll just uh, put it on the side. Uh, if we think about the structure today here in the United States, I would say there's considerable uh, safeguards that I would say would be comparable or similar to what we find in Awqaf guidelines. Uh, you know, uh, registering nonprofit corporation or, re or religious endowment for mosque and otherwise, I think the law in the widest scope is definitely would mirror, if not correspond to what uh, Islamic waqf institutions require. So I think in this sense, we could try to use and uh, apply certain aspects of what's present today in order for us to create our own uh, awqaf institutions. What I would pay considerable attention to, and that's my always worry, is what are the worst care scenarios that are present in Islamic history where these rulings emerge from, and how for us to articulate rules and regulations that meet the requirements in here, but also are cognizant of what happened. And I think that's where the challenge uh, is there, because there's many, many cases of abuse, there's many cases of violation, the intent of these awqaf, and I think we, we sh that's where we should spend considerable time uh, in there. Uh, on just a completely side note, many of our mosque institutions uh, have problematic structures because once again, 
they take on the institutions of a nonprofit corporation and basically replicate what we see possibly overseas of having exclusive control of everything. So it essentially begins to replicate, as Imam said, nation state structures rather than a religious structure. So each mosque becomes a nation state with a flag, minister of defense, minister of finance, rather than a uqaf property with the full sense of service. And I think that's where, you know, having migrated came from another structure and embodied certain understandings of nation state control mechanisms and replicating it in our own institutions in here. And I think those are things that we need to be aware of, uh, not to critique to destroy, but to critique to develop. And that's where constructive criticism has to be uh, engaged as we develop new ways for our awqaf. Okay. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair. May, may God bless you for, for attending. Um, I also want to remind everyone of, of our responsibility, having heard all of this information, to pass it on, work to implement it. And we ask God to give us the facilitation and the ease to implement this knowledge, to spread it to others, and to elevate our community and bring benefit to everyone around us. And please think of, of how, how you, in your community, whether in your local community, working on free clinics, institutions that take care of stray dogs, anything that was mentioned, and any other ideas as well, and also thinking about contributing to what's going on here at Zaytuna. As was mentioned, a lot of these ideas of walks endowments, they're being applied right here today, as are many parts of our Islamic tradition. And so, Jazakumullah khair, may Allah bless you for attending.